Good evening, and welcome to the 2010. Wow, that's the fastest I've seen an audience get quiet. Thank you. Uh, one order of housekeeping, if you could uh, please uh, take your cell phones and uh, go to vibrate from youth, that would be appreciated. My name is Nick Mitchell, and I serve as the chair of the Grazia Dio Alumni Network Council of Los Angeles for the Grazia Dio School of Business and management. I'm privileged to welcome you to tonight's forum. As the council chair, I work with a team of dedicated alumni volunteers who are actively engaged in building new bridges between the Grazia Dio School of Business and Management and the community here in LA. These volunteers are all working professionals who take time out of their busy schedules to support the efforts of our alma mater. I'd like to take the opportunity to recognize some of them that are here with us tonight. If you can please stand when I call your name. Nathan Chandra, Maisha Sherman, Tim Shimbara, Lisa Stewart, Lauren Shaw, and Alphonse Loro. <laughs> I'd like to also offer a special thanks to fellow council members that were on the healthcare forum subcommittee we formed, who gave their time and energy to make this night possible. If you would also stand, Steve Todd, Chris Wicker, and Bezad Shakibai. Thank you. In addition, I would like to thank our faculty moderators, Dr. Charlie Kearns, Dr. Gary Mangiafico, Dr. Samuel Seaman, for their participation and the Center of Applied Research and the Grazia Dio Business Review for videotaping the forum tonight and for publishing the brief of this evening's event. And lastly, I would like to thank the staff, faculty, student and alumni volunteers who made tonight's night a success. In particular, Christina LaRubio, Jeff, Jennifer McMillan, and Jesse Torres. We are sincerely grateful for your support. The goal of, the, of our GAN Council is to create opportunities for personal and professional growth for our alumni and students in the Los Angeles area. This summer and fall, we will be focusing our attention on a few exciting activities. Private capital market events in collaboration with Professor John Paglia. The Magic Johnson Foundation Leadership Conference, which is taking place in the third week of July. And for fun and networking, a social Grazia Dio Night Out or two. If you're interested in getting involved in our activities, I encourage you to visit one of our monthly meetings at the West LA campus, or feel free to give me your business cards before you leave tonight. I hope you will enjoy tonight's forum, which features some of the most respected individuals working in the healthcare industry. And I hope to see all of you at other events of ours in the future. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the Grazia Dio School of Business and Management, Dr. Linda Livingston.
Uh, Nick mentioned that we are going to have a brief, uh, a written brief on this event tonight in the future, and that is actually being sponsored by our brand new Center for Applied Research. We just uh, launched that center this fall, and Dr. Mark Chun, and Mark, I know you're here somewhere, they're back in the back. Dr. Mark Chun has just been named the director of our Center for Applied Research and hit the ground running with these kinds of events and providing this kind of support for what we're doing. So we look forward to that. We look forward to more coming out of that center as we really look at how the research and work that we're doing really can have an impact in the business community. This forum is particularly important to us, not just because healthcare is such a hot issue in the world today, but because uh, we are really looking at how we can better serve the business community in terms of education around healthcare uh, issues and preparing business leaders to uh, go into the healthcare industry. And so one of the things we're doing is, is investigating and looking at an option to do an emphasis in healthcare services within our fully employed MBA program. We've spent about a year doing a lot of research. Some of you in the room have been involved in that. Uh, we have that in a faculty committee right now that's refining that. And our hope is that as that moves forward, we'll be able to launch that next year uh, as part of our uh, emphasis tracks within our fully employed MBA. So this event tonight is very important. It helps us inform that process. Uh, and we hope that you'll pay attention to that and look for that uh, in the coming year within our program area. But tonight we're really privileged uh, to have a very special guest, or I guess we're really guests of his here uh, in the Four Seasons Hotel, to have David Murdoch with us as our keynote speaker. And um, Mr. Murdoch is, as you know, chairman of the Dole Food Company in Castle and Cook. Um, but he has several passions in life that I think we'll, we will see as he gets up here and speaks to us tonight. Um, on sort of the more informal side of his life, he actually is a breeder of prize Arabian horses, and he has a, an orchid collection of over 30,000 plants. Um, he also has a, a wonderful uh, farm near here that has some amazing uh, uh, plants and rocks from all around the world. It's an amazing place that if you ever have the privilege of being on that property. Uh, but in addition to his serious business interests, um, his passion in life is really about health and wellness, as you can see from this facility and the, the Health and Longevity Institute that is located here. Uh, he's published several books, one of those, the Dole Nutrition Handbook, What to Eat and How to Live for a Longer, Healthier Life, was actually just awarded the prestigious Living Now Book Award and the Gold Medal Prize, so it's being recognized nationally and internationally for what it's contributing to health and wellness around the world. He's also helped develop the North Carolina Research Campus, which is focused on the betterment of the world's health and nutrition, and is conducting a study called the Murdoch Study at Duke University that looks at advanced technologies uh, to really help us understand uh, debilitating diseases, how to predict and, and test those more effectively. Um, he is a leader in this field. He has uh, not only uh, doing this in the work that he does, doing it uh, on, in his life personally, uh, but it's really trying to spread the, the gospel of healthy living and healthy eating. And so I know you'll look forward to, to listening to what he has to say. Before I bring Mr. Murdoch up, that we are going to show you a clip uh, from a video. He was actually on a clip with Oprah Winfrey, and you will get to see how he actually lives out his passion in his life. So let's watch the video, and then we'll bring Mr. Murdoch up. welcoming Mr. David Murdoch. I've seen that a couple of times and it kind of embarrassed me some of the things that she said and some of the things she asked me. And she said, you can say anything about me you want. So I said a couple of things that were a little bit on the uh, colorful side. And she <laughs> said, that's OK to go. But when I, she, I called her and I said, well, what's out? Why isn't it in there? She said, I didn't put it out. 
And she said that people said that couldn't be put on television. <laughs> it sounds a lot worse than it was. I wanted to thank the Dean for inviting me here tonight. Uh, when I look over the audience, uh, I see a few people that I know, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact I have an honorary doctorate from Pepperdine. Gotten several years ago. I have always had a great admiration for the university. I think uh, everybody and uh, all of the young people in the world would like to get in if they could. I'd like to get there too. Uh, I would say I only have an eighth grade education and I got very poor grades there. So uh, I had to learn as I went along. I want to welcome everyone to what we've put together here for health and for longevity. And I'm probably a little bit more interested in longevity than some of you. <laughs> uh, when I was uh, 30 years old, I thought I'll live forever, never paid any attention to it. I ate as I wanted to. Uh, I ate saturated fat, I loved whipped cream, uh, I loved uh, uh, great juicy steaks and so forth. Uh, I shudder now to even think about them, but I'm sure that how many people here have eaten saturated fat in the last month? Show me your hand. <laughs> I'm ashamed of you. <laughs> That's more than half of the room, and I'm sure that you know that there are more than 60% of the people are overweight, and 40%, I've been saying that for quite a few years. I just had a note the other day, I should stop saying that because 60%, there are more than 60% that are overweight, and there are about 42 or 43% obese. Um, I'm always worried about keeping my weight up because I eat so well that I never really gain any weight at all. And I think that we have built here uh, a complete center for wellness. There's very little bit that you could want to do that you couldn't do here, whether it is any kind of exercise. I try to exercise every day. I try to be honest about that and say I try because sometimes I fail. And uh, I'd say, how many people here exercise five days a week? By your hands. Well, now that's pretty good. I'd say about 15, maybe 20 percent. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to do, but I try to make sure I do it four times, maybe three times, maybe five times. So that sort of shows you that I'm a little erotic about it myself. But uh, you're going to get a couple of little uh, pamphlets here. I don't think that they get passed out yet. Did everybody get these? Uh, if anybody didn't, I think there's going to be some at the front desk. The thing that I have learned uh, my wife died of cancer. I was eating everything and anything, and so was she. And then I started to reading about it. This was in 1985. And I realized at that point in time that there wasn't anything at all that I was eating properly. And I decided that I would change all of that with all my sadness, uh, realizing that you can't back up. And I realize that I tell all of you here, you cannot back up easily if you are overweight. But your body, if you go on the proper diet and you lose the weight and you get into the shape you can, your body will clean out your your arteries, your heart, can be cleaned out over a period of 
nobody knows for sure, but maybe five years of really working at it, you can get yourself back into good shape. I am in very excellent shape. I'm never tired, I have tremendous energy, uh, more so than most of my young uh, business associates. Uh, we travel the world because Doe is in 94 countries of the world, and many of my friends hardly get on our plane before they're sound asleep. Uh, that's not me. I wanted to say uh, that I've done a couple of books. Uh, there's one of them out there, and I'm not selling books tonight. I'm, there's some of them out there, but that's not my purpose. I tried putting books out, and I tried teaching people how to eat. And I gave books to my friends, and I asked them a month or two later, uh, how are you coming on reading the book? I'm in how far? Oh, it's on my coffee table. But uh, we're really got to be working on that very religiously when. But we've got a lot of things we're doing right. People don't pay any attention. Great big book I did with Mayo Clinic. I did the Encyclopedia of Food. And that was a four pound book. That's why you got these little books here. Which <laughs> The four pound books didn't go over very well. They're in most of the universities and they're in libraries and everything else. But boy, was it a lost leader when I tried to solve it. So, the book that's out there, we have 12 experts, PhDs, MDs, and PhDs. I work extensively in North Carolina. Uh, the Murdoch study is done by Duke. I supply the financial money to that. We are doing a complete study that will be a new scientific book on various types of diseases and we're doing scientific study. I built the largest scientific lab ever built in the world and I bought and I paid personally. There's no government money in there. Myself, I am very, very much an individual that believes that knowledge is power. When you only have an eighth grade education as I have, you better get some knowledge somewhere along the way. So I've been uh, like a vacuum sweeper trying to scoop up all the knowledge that I could and I think that I have gained some knowledge. And everyone else could gain that kind of knowledge also if they wanted to because the power of knowledge for your health and what you eat and how often you should eat it. My friends all know if they're overweight, I poke them in the tummy and I say, you want to keep this, you know? It's going to hurt you. I hope I'm not bothering anybody in the room because I'm sure you're all as thin as I am. <laughs> and I think that uh, the prevention is the best cure you can possibly have. Because if you do not prevent yourself from overeating, you cannot help but expect the problems that will come. I'm, I can almost say I'm never sick a day in my life. I am always energetic. I'm very much use my brain, and when we get done, I'm going to give you a little poetry uh, to show you life. I have certain ways of using my brain, because I would say that everything that you do, that you study at Pepperdine, everything that you eat or that you drink, goes into your brain. Now, if you eat sugar, if you eat just a spoonful of sugar. These are all facts from our research studies that we have in our North Carolina core lab, which is the largest core lab known to be in America. And if you eat a teaspoonful of sugar, 25% approximately of that sugar goes right into your brain, straight. Your brain, your brain has a call on everything that goes into your body and certain things it will cause. So 
Your brain can't tell the difference between a fact and a fantasy. Now, so you say, I like sugar, I like my donuts, I like sugar in my coffee or sugar in my tea. Well, you're sending the wrong message to your brain because your brain says, I want that too. I want the sugar. And you see sugar and right away you think, that's what I need. I used to eat Dunkin' Donuts too, you know. <laughs> but I wouldn't touch one anymore, and I'm sure they're very good. I do drink Dunkin' Donuts coffee. <laughs> I love coffee, and coffee, by the way, can be beneficial for you. I have been more than 25 years devoutly interested in what to eat and devoutly interested in how could I cure my body of the lust for food. You all eat, I can say, in this room by your taste buds. Because what do you think of when you want something? You think, oh, I like the taste of that. Cheeseburgers, double cheeseburgers, double hamburgers, double cheeseburgers, mayonnaise sauce. Your brain says, hey, I like that, because you've taught your brain. Your brain is like a calculator. It works upon the things that you put into it. And once you tell yourself that you like all the wrong thing, your brain will constantly say, well, let's get some of it. <laughs> and that is what you call emotional motivation. I don't deal in that. I think, is this good for me? What will this do? Well, as time's gone by, all the things in the little pamphlet that you're going to get are things that I eat, with a couple of exceptions that are in there, because everybody says the guy had that. I think that uh, if, you, if you avoid saturated fat, mayonnaise, butter, I shiver when I see the waiter at the restaurant bring a great big square pan of bowl of butter. And I see somebody slice into it with the knife, I think. There's another artery that's going to get something that shouldn't get. <laughs> you got to learn to think that way. Because you think yourself into overweight. And it's very hard to think yourself about losing weight. Because it doesn't take much motivation for your taste bud to say, I like something that's bad for you but it takes a great deal of willpower to say, I am not going to eat anything that's bad. Then the most important thing is to know what is bad for you. Now, uh, I, I like to ask, I, I give speeches uh, around uh, the country at different universities and the different business meetings. So I always like to ask the audience questions because I, Sometimes makes them think a little bit. How many of you in this room, now be truthful with me, eat saturated fat because it tastes good, because all saturated fat does taste good. Let me see your hand if you're eating. Do you ever think that that's something that you're putting into your stomach that's bad for you? But if you haven't thought about it, I'm going to tell you it's about the worst thing you can put into your stomach. And you, all you have to do is wait a little while and you can see it growing the tummy. And that's where it goes. First, uh, men and women. And unfortunately, when you see mom and dad walk down the street and they're both overweight, and they have three children walking behind them. Nine times out of ten, you'll see the children are overweight too. And that's something that we intend to try to work with somewhere. And we'd like to work with Pepperdine. Uh, I would hope that Pepperdine would put some programs together and we'd help supply them. Because we have not only the Murdoch study, which is a very extensive study that will tell uh, all about 
what causes cancer, who has it, what can we do to avoid it, and so forth. We've been doing that now for four and a half years, and we have studied today about 4,000 men and women, and we are now just starting on children because we found out when mom and dad uh, are in bad health trouble, it's not long before the children die. And you can be constantly having a cold, constantly. I never get a headache. I never get back aches. I never get leg aches. I never get knee aches. I never get muscle aches. Well, sometimes I get muscle aches because I do a lot of that stuff with my I have a gym in my house that's very large, and I have lots of equipment there to use. But you have to plan ahead what you're going to do to keep your life. I think uh, I'm 87 years old, and I intend to live a lot longer because I don't feel any different than I felt when I was 45. Now, I'm smart enough to know there's a difference. But I find that more by looking in the mirror than I do by anything else. And I think that everyone here needs to look in the mirror when you just get out of the shower, have a nice mirror nearby and say, am I happy with what I see here of this man that I just uh, was in the shower with? Or I should say the woman too, because women have the same problem as men. We talk about the men more because the men are a little bit more out visible than the women are in the public uh, area. So I think you have to end up, the very first thing you have to be is honest with yourself. So I would ask everyone that's in the room tonight to ask yourself, am I happy with the way my body looks? And then you think back, because this group here obviously all was in Pepperdine, uh, I hope, or at least in one of the other great universities like Pepperdine. And we had quite a nice body. The girls were happy with the way they looked, and uh, they uh, were at the football games and the basketball games, all looking real nice and so forth. And then it's time to go by and you say, well, why don't you put on the dress that you had when you uh, were out on the football field? The girls say, well, you can't do that anymore because the girls grow out of their uniforms that they wore and the men grow out of their basketball and football clothes. And you say, well, that's just part of living. I don't say that. I say that's the part of living I don't want to live over again because I ate too much. I didn't have the body I liked and I didn't have the way I wanted to be and I wondered if my wife could have lived longer had I known what I know today. Absolutely positive truth. I believe that it is possible to avoid not in every case I will put that exception in, but you can avoid breast cancer, prostate cancer, female cancer, all kinds of cancers, if you eat well. Now there are some people that genetically do not have that capability, so I am not making a statement about that. But don't you believe that you're one of them that is genetically incapable of keeping your body in shape? because that's probably a lie unto your brain. And your brain is what keeps you in the shape. But you have to program your brain. If you sit down to a new computer, you do a lot of work before it becomes of any value to you. Well, you've got to do a lot of work on your brain because before it can become of any value. My son, Justin, who's up here in the front, is uh, the chairman of uh, company that we, uh, Novorex, that we are doing. We're in third stage on a major cancer discovery. We believe that we may have something that would be spectacular, a non-invasive type uh, of 
situation uh, that will prevent cancer. And we are very far along working now with the government, and we think maybe in nine months, 12 months, we'll maybe be successful in that. But I have undertaken all kinds of studies that I'm doing with Duke, I'm doing discoveries with Chapel Hill, uh, Wake Forest, mostly in the work. I have a home in North Carolina, so I have had that for many years. And so I know many of the professors back there. In the book that's out there, I have a dozen professors, MD, PhDs, that helped in the writing of the book. I think that uh, the very fact that you come to the realization you are the master of your fate. I sometimes hear about people that had heart attacks at a very young age, and you can usually trace that back to improper eating. In order to be healthy, you have to stay active. You cannot be passive. You have to use your brain because your brain is part of what you need to look at. You have to exercise not only your body, but your brain. Now, most businessmen and most business ladies all have to use their brain to do things. But creating with your brain is far more important than just doing routine work day in and day out that doesn't utilize your brain. You need to actively on a daily basis. I write poetry. I shouldn't be able to. I'm going to give you a poem at the end. I can recite, I can truthfully say I can recite 100 poems from beginning to end. I may miss one word or two in the poem along the way, but I've memorized those poems. I can write poetry. I never do anything about it. I never had any education in it. But I tried pentamic rhythm in poetry. You can teach yourself anything. I keep teaching myself something new all the time. I can almost say every month I learn a lot of new things. And nowadays, it's all about health, because that is my number one interest. Why? Primarily, I want to keep myself healthy. So I have to know that knowledge, just like I say to you. The only power you have is your own power for health. So I would like to say I stay active, daily exercise, of my body and my mind. Now, if I say, get yourself a book of poetry and memorize some poem, that's pretty nonsensical for me to say because nobody's going to do that. But I always liked reading poetry. And when I was a young boy, from starting with about the age of five, my mom loved poetry and she made me learn poetry. So ever since then, that's always been a part of my brain, was poetry. And if you learn how to read poetry and think about it, that's good utilization of your brain. Some people say I play bridge or do crossword puzzles or all sorts of things. But if you're in business, you get to use it all the time. And nowadays, with the economy where it is, got to work a little harder. At least I do. So daily workouts, I do yoga, not regularly, but I do yoga when I begin to think, gee, I'm getting a little bit tied up in my back or somewhere. But I never have back pain because I always think about it ahead of time, I better do something about it. I would tell you all, and I could ask you all, you all take care of your car. So you got air in the tire, the torrential wipers work, that you got oil in your crankcase, that you got gasoline in your tank, uh, that you got the car washed, you got everything taken care of. And then you go out and eat 
double hamburgers or something, and you would never put the wrong kind of gas or the wrong kind of air or the wrong kind of windshield wipers in the car. So you take better care of your automobile in many cases than you do your own body. I think that uh, brain exercise is very, very important, very important. And having a determination that you are going to success, be successful at losing weight. You're very successful at putting it on. That would be a great help to put on. All you got to do is say, my taste buds, because that's what, where your desire comes from, is your taste buds. You say, well, you know, like, I don't drink milk. I take very little orange juice, but I eat the rinds of orange juice. I eat the rinds of banana. Uh, I'm kind of crazy, but I did a study on it. There's more nutritional value in the rind of oranges or the skin of a banana than there is inside. So I make juices and I put all kinds of different things into it. I grow broccoli sprouts. It's very easy. You can just get the seeds and put them in little things that you can buy and set them in the window and in a couple of days you got broccoli sprouts. I believe that the broccoli sprouts have more nutritional value than the great big of broccoli and I really don't like broccoli. <laughs> so broccoli sprouts don't bother me at all so I think I'm in it incorrectly. I think that the uh, opportunity that we all have to look after ourselves. You can have everybody in the world tell you what to eat and what to do. When I did my first book, I did, I guess it was eight or nine years ago, I did it with Mayo Clinic where I've been active for many years. Uh, and weighed four pounds. I was happy as could be. I thought everybody's going to want this book, the Encyclopedia of Foods. What kind of recipes and everything. Biggest flop I ever did. Four pounds. People didn't even want to carry it home. So then the next one that was out there, I made it much smaller and I made it much easier to understand. And people said, I don't have time to read that book. I mean, they got a thousand pages in there. I don't, I'm never going to read it. They didn't make any bones about it. So as it went by, it came down to this. And I think, did all of you get the, the little pamphlets here that has all of the showing? Is there anyone that didn't get one of these? Looks like they got, we got them passed out the, the correctly. Thing. So, uh, if you look at the, in the pages of the book, I tried to tell you all the different things about what it is that you need to eat and why you need to eat and what's in it in the need to eat. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to be working on something that we can do that will be for moms and dads, something that would be kind of fun for children that will tell them what to do too. Because if you start things at an early age, you continue with it for a long time. And if you uh, just decide you're going to do something tomorrow, uh, today, and, well, tomorrow you decide you'll do it the next day and the next day. So I, I uh, would ask you uh, another question. How many people feel they need to pay? In the room, how many of you feel you need to pay attention to what you eat? If you're satisfied with it, don't. But I'd like to see how many pay, are interested in pay attention to what they eat. Well, more than half, perhaps. But I think that Pepperdine is very well advised to be in the vanguard, because I say that because everybody's talking about it, everybody's writing about it, very few people are doing anything about it. So I would be happy to supply Pepperdine. We have 
tons of knowledge. And I mean, we have library full of everything. We have major studies being done by Duke at the present time, major studies by Cordine has every major piece of equipment that could possibly be put in. I spent over a hundred million dollars just on the equipment inside the laboratory and another 450 million building the campus. So I'm very deeply financially buried in health. And I would like to have you not bury your brain, but open your mind and realize you can do anything you want to do. Knowledge is power. I try to supply you with a minimum amount. This is maximum if you use it because it tells you everything you need to eat, almost. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at it and say, oh, I like the pictures of the electric jet. I eat some of that once in a while. I would try that. I didn't know that. You've got to end up saying, I want to learn. The only power you have for your health is your own knowledge. You can go around asking everybody, what should you eat? What should you do? They can't tell you, even if they know because you aren't distant hard enough. And you gotta have something in writing. I've learned that for myself. That's why I made these little things. So you can put them in your purse for maybe it's in my shirt pocket or right here. And I take it with me. And sometimes I think, and believe me, I've spent many of my years of reading and I still have to stop and think every day, what do I want to eat that's good for me? And I, I eat uh, sardines uh, every morning of my life at home. I have certain things that I eat because omega-3 is the most important thing. The biggest shortage that you have in your body, and I can almost predict this right now, is vitamin D. And the only way you get enough fiber, you get vitamin D from food, but in very limited quantities. But you need to take your shirt off, or whatever, and walk out in the sun for 15 minutes. And you need to do that a couple of times a week, and it will keep you from having bad joints. Vitamin D is good for the bones. Vitamin D is good for almost everything and helping you use the things that you put into your stomach that are good for you. So you need, there are certain things that you have to get in vitamin D. I get it from the sun. I got a little terrace up there by my bedroom. I go outside and I don't have anything. So expose yourself <laughs> to success. <laughs> you didn't know what I was going to say. You were thinking something else. I wasn't. Because you expose yourself for vitamin D. And if you do nothing else but get your vitamin D, and get omega-3, desperately need omega-3. And mostly you can, I, I say to myself, I can only get it from seafood. I do not eat any meat from any kind of an animal. I only eat, I am a fish vegetarian now. But true vegetarians say, you're not a vegetarian. Well, if you say you eat fish, because that's a true vegetarian won't eat any kind of flesh from anything. I eat sardines, uh, I get the medium-sized sardines because they have a lot of calcium in the little bones that you can very easily eat. I, I've got a little theory about every single solitary thing that I eat, when I need to eat it, how much I need to eat it, and uh, I would like to have you think uh, when you left here and you take this little book here and that little book is for free. 
that you have got a pocket full of knowledge of the food you eat and why. There's certain kind of things you need depending on some of the problems you have. And if you learn, and if you say, if you say, I got a backache, well, I can tell you the kind of exercise to get rid of a backache. Because I sometimes have a little backache, so I go in and I do a belly down and a belly up for 10 or 15 times, and it's gone. So you learn a little bit how to take care of your body. And that is the most important thing to be healthy. I never get a headache. If I drink a glass, I won't make any name mention, but if I drink a glass of something that's very famous with about eight teaspoons of sugar in it, um, I get a headache. Sugar will give you a headache if you take enough quantities of it. How many people here get a headache once in a while? Half the hands. Then you should stop and think, well, what am I eating because I get it? Very rarely will your body cause you to have a headache. It will otherwise, but very rarely will it cause you to have a headache if you do not eat something that your body doesn't want. And the most particular one is sugar. I do not eat anything with sugar, and I do not use salt at all. But I use other types of seasoning. You don't really need salt. Salt is bad for you. And sugar, sugar is probably the worst poison you can put in your body. I call it poison. Now, the sugar company wouldn't like it. And we used to grow in Hawaii because I own the island of the Nile. How many have been to my island of the Nile? I'm happy to see that about 15%. I want all the rest of them to go there too. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to say I've enjoyed chatting with you. I would take questions. Uh, I hope that you realize that knowledge is power. And before I do, I'm going to tell you the poem. There's a movie out now uh, by the name of Invictus. How many of you know Invictus? Quite a few. You can check me out. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the felt clutch of circumstance, I have not winced, nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbound. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the menace of the shade, and yet the horror in the years find and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So I want all of you to be in control of your fate because your fate depends on what you eat. Thank you very much.
But unfortunately, you can't teach it in the classroom when you've got a machine outside that you put a dollar in or whatever it is and it kicks out things you shouldn't drink or eat. And that's part of the problem in the schools because you can get all the things you shouldn't have very easily and everybody goes through them. But you need to teach it in school and Pepperdine could add a class and we'd be willing to help you in any way we could. Another question? Right here, we'll end with this. I'd just like to thank you for uh, the old products and all the uh, bananas and fruit that you provide for various school functions like the uh, 5 10K runs and things like that because it helps uh, show that you're interested in uh, helping other people keep alive. We have done that and we do do that. But all the schools are short of money. And there are millions of schools here, so if I tried to supply them all for free, I wouldn't last very long. So we have to, but we do offer to do it at cost uh, situations. Uh, I am the largest fruit and vegetable grower in the world in the bill of food. But uh, it's very difficult to uh, to get the right things in the schools. They want it, but it's impossible to do it.